Hi there. Today I'd like to talk to you about the Hall Effect. So the Hall Effect was discovered in 1879 by American physicist Edwin Hall. What happens in the Hall Effect is, let's say that you have a current carrying a conductor and you place it in an external magnetic field. Now remember, the conductor itself generates a magnetic field, but I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about placing the current carrying conductor in an external field, okay? When that happens, a potential difference or a voltage is generated in a direction that's perpendicular to both the current and the magnetic field. And this is called the Hall Effect. This voltage comes because when you have your current, let's say in this picture here, we have our uh, current carrying conductor in blue, and we have a current flowing to the right through our current carrying conductor. In this picture, I've indicated my magnetic field in the green circles with the X's around them. So this magnetic field is going into your screen, okay? Now what happens is, let's imagine that this current that's going to the right is due to positive charge carriers. Now that can happen if you have, for example, a semiconductor um, and you have the holes being the charge carriers, okay? So imagine that you have your positive charge carriers traveling to the right, so QV points to the right. Well, because of that external magnetic field, QV cross B, so here you have QV, right, pointing to the right, and B into your screen, and then that would mean that the force on those positive charge carriers in that external magnetic field would be upwards. So your positive charge carriers would then be moved to the top part of our little blue conductor, as we see here. And that would leave a net negative charge on the other side of your conductor down here at the bottom. Okay? Now, that charge separation builds up an electric field in between the sides, which causes a voltage. Okay? So that's the cause of the Hall effect. The fact that if you have charges moving through an external magnetic field, then there's a force exerted on those charges according to F is equal to QV cross B. So, like I said, um, the charge carriers are going to build up at the edges of the bar, the top and the bottom edges here, okay? And that's according to the right-hand rule. But this can't happen forever. And the reason that it can't happen forever is because those charges create an electric field in the material, as I stated just a few seconds ago. So in this case, we have our positive charge carriers on the top of our bar and our negative charge carriers on the bottom. That would mean that the electric field caused by this charge separation would point downwards, okay? Well, which way would positive charges want to move in this electric field? Well, they would want to move with the flow of the electric field, so they would want to move down. So what happens in the Hall effect is that charge builds up at first on the top part of the bar until there's an electric field that's strong enough to cancel out the effect of that magnetic field. So in other words, if you have positive charge carriers, the F is equal to QV cross B force wants to deflect them upwards, but the resulting electric field that builds up wants to deflect those charges downwards. Now, force obeys superposition, and so what will happen is charge will build up on the top until the electric field is strong enough to compensate for that, and then at that point, the charges will just move through undisturbed. Okay? So there's a finite limit to the charge separation and hence the voltage that can build up due to the Hall effect, because eventually, as I show here down in this bottom diagram, my little red positive charge carrier is um, my little hole here, and you can see the, the magnetic force F sub B points upward, and it's equal and opposite to the electrical force which points downward, and so they cancel out, and so your positive charge carrier just, just drifts along undisturbed once it reaches this threshold value where the charge doesn't build up anymore, okay? So let's put some math to that. We're going to say, um, relating back to an earlier um, lecture, that the velocity of our charge carriers is our drift velocity, which is V sub D. Now everything is um, uh, perpendicular in our QV cross B product, so the magnitude of F is equal to QV cross B here is just QV sub D times D, okay? And when it reaches that threshold, that voltage where it can't build up anymore, right, and the forces balance out, then Q V sub D B equals Q E. Now when we have that, our charges will cancel out on either side, the Q's cancel, and so we end up with V sub D times B is equal to E. Remember here that B is our magnetic field strength and capital E is our electric field strength, okay? 
Now, if we're to multiply both sides of this equation by the width of the bar, which I call d, then what happens is on the right-hand side we end up with e times d, okay? Now remember our relationship of delta v, our voltage to our electric field. Delta v is equal to the negative integral of e dot d, okay? And so the magnitude of ed is just the magnitude of our Hall voltage. The sign of a Hall voltage depends upon which type of charge carrier builds up at the top of the bar, right? Positive or negative? We'll talk more about that in a second. So this Hall voltage then, delta VH is equal to ED, which is equal to our drift velocity times our magnetic field strength times the width of the bar. So if we look at this equation a little bit more, our Hall voltage is equal to V sub D VD, then we can solve for the drift velocity from the equation for the current that we derived in an earlier lecture on the Druda model of conduction. Remember that from that model, we set the current equal to NQA V sub D. Here, N is the charge carrier density. Q is the charge in coulombs and SI units for each charge carrier. A is the cross-sectional area, and V sub D is our drift velocity. Remember that the cross-sectional area is the area pierced by the current. So if the current is going this way, if the current is my finger, then the cross-sectional area would be the palm of my hand, okay? Now remember our definition of current divided by cross-sectional area was our current density, J. So we can set equal our drift velocity to, when we rearrange this uh, equation here, J over NQ, all right? So plugging that in to our equation for our Hall voltage, we end up with J over NQ times BD is equal to our Hall voltage, all right? Note here that your area, the big A, would be the cross-sectional area of the bar. Now the Hall effect has been put to good use. So for example, you can have Hall probes, and here's some pictures of them. This is um, some that are commercially available from Lakeshore. And you can use them to measure magnetic fields, if you know your current, your bar dimensions, and your charge density. And you may have heard of Hall probes. Now if the magnetic field is what is known, then information can be obtained regarding the sign of the charge carriers and the charge carrier density, okay? So depending on what you want to know, you can use it to, uh, you can tailor your equipment to measure that thing. Let's talk just a little bit more about exploring the charge carrier density and the sign of the charge carriers using the Hall effect. I've already talked about what happens if you have positive charge carriers. That's the image here at the bottom. In this case, I had a magnetic field into the screen, the charge carriers were moving to the right, and so just like I've been talking about in this lecture, the positive charge carriers got deflected to the top of the bar according to QV cross V. No problem, okay? So that's the bottom, that's a recap. But now what happens if you have charge carriers that are negative? For example, electrons. Okay, well in this case, we're still going to have the magnetic field into the screen, okay? and our current is still going to go to the right, okay? But remember that current is defined as the direction of positive charge flow, okay? So if current is defined as positive charge flow direction, then that means that the drift velocity for the electrons would be to the left, opposite to the direction of the current. So then you have, you know, your charge, your drift velocity would be this way. But remember in the F is equal to QV cross V, you're going to be multiplying Q times V, and that gives the direction of the vector. So in this case, QV would be to the right because the charge is negative, okay? So then when you do QV cross V, you get upwards. And so just like in the positive charge carriers, the negative charge carriers would be deflected upwards. It's a little counterintuitive. So if you don't understand it, I suggest that at this point you pause the video and make sure that you can go over it in your head and it makes sense to you, okay? So you can see that in the Hall effect, you can use the Hall effect and see which way your voltage goes, right? So your Hall voltage as measured by this probe would be negative if you put your probes at points A and point C, okay? And then you know that it was your negative charge carriers, right, that were moving. And then here, if your Hall effect voltage was positive as measured by the probes at A and C, then you would know that you had positive charge carriers, okay? 
So that's how you would determine the sign of the charge carriers. Now in my example problem, I'll explore how you determine the charge carrier density. Here we say the Hall voltage across a one millimeter thick conductor in a one Tesla magnetic field is 3.2 microvolts when the current is 15 amps. What's the charge carrier density in this conductor? Okay. So in this case, you've measured the dimensions of your Hall effect probe. You know what the magnetic field is, assuming you've already calibrated your probe maybe, for example. And then you know um, what the uh, current is. So you know everything, okay? So let's use our equation for our Hall effect here. And that was J over NQ times BD is equal to our Hall voltage, as we showed on the previous slide. Now let's remember that J is our current density which is the current divided by the cross-sectional area. So that would mean that I over ANQ times BD is equal to our Hall voltage. But now what is our cross-sectional area? Well, our cross-sectional area, assuming that it's a rectangular conductor, would be the thickness of the conductor and then times the width, which I call D. So A here would be D times T, T meaning the thickness. So then we end up with an equation, I over DTNQ times BD. Well, you got a D on the top and a D on the bottom, so those Ds cancel out. And you end up with an equation, I over TNQ times B is equal to your Hall voltage. Okay, so now we're ready to start plugging and chugging. So we have here that our Hall voltage was 3.2 microvolts. That's 3.2 times 10 to the minus 6 volts. And then that's going to equal to I times B, 15 amps times 1 Tesla, divided by the thickness, which is 1 millimeter, or 0 0.001 meters, divided by N, and then divided by the charge of the charge carrier, which is 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Okay? If you solve for N in that equation, plug everything into your calculator, you end up with a charge carrier density of 2.9 times 10 to the 28th charge carriers per cubic meter. Okay? So you can see that if you have a cal carefully calibrated Hall probe and you know your current and your magnetic field and everything else, then you can use that to calculate your charge carrier density. All right? Okay. Um, I hope that answers your questions about the Hall effect, but if not, you know where to find me and I'll see you in class.